Our gospel lesson this morning is going to come from Luke's gospel, from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And I invite you to stand as you're able, in body or in spirit, for the reading of our gospel lesson. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You will name him Jesus, and he will be great. He will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth is in her old age, has also conceived, her, has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren. For nothing is impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Recently, I had a conference in Birmingham. It was one of those conferences that I kind of forgot that I had. You know how it is when you, when you schedule something or you have something in your calendar, and you kind of forget about it? You look up and say, oh, no, I've got this thing this week that I've forgotten that I had, and you've got to clear your schedule and all that. So I wasn't really all that excited about going to it. And then um, it happened to fall on the day after I had, we had something in Hattiesburg with Sarah, so I drove from church. And when I got off work that day at 5, down to Hattiesburg and went to that concert and then left Hattiesburg about 10 o'clock that night to go to Birmingham. Uh, pulled into my hotel about 2 o'clock that morning, got about two or three hours sleep, went to the conference, had the second day of it. And then I wasn't going to stay one extra night, so I got in the car at 5 o'clock that, that day or 3 o'clock to drive home because I was so ready to be home. The best part about going away is coming back home, is my opinion. Nothing sleeps like your, like your own bed. So there I am, leaving Birmingham at 3. And you know, if you, if you have a smartphone, a lot of our smartphones will give you a little, a little notification. Hey, traffic backed up so-and-so. So I'm leaving Birmingham, heading home, and I get a little notification on my map that says traffic backed up in Livingston. I'm like, Livingston? It's like three hours from here. I'm not even worried about that. So I get on the road to come home. And about the time I got to about York, Alabama, if you know where that is, traffic stopped. It was like a parking lot. It was like Highland Colony. I mean, there was nothing moving. It was awful. For like 30 minutes, nothing moving. I put my car in park. I'm like, I'm going to sit here. On, I'm just going to put it in park and sit here. And there wasn't a single thing in the world that I could have done. I hate waiting. I don't wait well. I don't wait well at the red, red light in front of Starbucks, right there off Highland Colony. You know what I'm talking about. I don't wait well there. I don't wait well in the doctor's office. I, I am not an individual who waits well or likes to wait. And so there I was, just, just stuck in traffic. There wasn't anything I could do. I could fuss. I could holler. I could run around the car. There wasn't anything I could do. I was stuck and I was not moving. There was not a single thing I could do to make that line of cars move. Finally, it started moving, but then traffic had gotten so backed up that it was like a bumper to bumper ride all the way through Meridian until 59 split off and went south. It was bumper to bumper, and it about drove me crazy. I got off in forest and went the back roads. I was so ready to get home. I was tired of waiting. Very few of us in our life like to wait. Waiting is not a thing that people enjoy. And in fact, 
if you like to wait, there's a certain scientific word. Um, I, I think the best translation from the Greek for those who like to wait is called weirdo. <laughs> no one likes to wait. It is a terrible waste of time. It's awful. I can't stand it. And very few of us like to wait. But here's the thing. It seems as though within Scripture that waiting is something the people of God are called to do and are forced to do over and over and over. We see God call Abraham. He tells him, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the shore. And when Abraham died, he had one who would be the lineage for him, Isaac. He didn't know what was to, he knew what God had promised him, but all he saw was that one he had to wait. Then the people of God were slaves in Egypt. They cried for years for freedom. And what did they do for years? They waited. And then we see them finally escape their bondage in Exodus. And they get to the wilderness, finally have freedom. And they wander. And they wait for 40 years. They wait for a king like David. They wait for a Messiah who was to come in Christ the Lord. But here's the thing. But you know the length of time between the last prophet of the Old Testament and the birth of Jesus? It's 400 years. 400 years the people of God waited. That's twice the age of our nation. They waited. We see Jesus waiting in the desert, in the wilderness, fasting. We see the church now, us, waiting for his return. When you look over and over and over and over in Scripture, it seems like waiting is something that the people of God are called to do. It seems like waiting is more a feature than a bug, if you will. It seems like something, something over in the Bible that God calls his people to do is to wait. Why is that? Why does God call us to wait? Why does it seem like waiting is just part of the Christian life? Why is that? Is God just trying to frustrate us? Perhaps. Perhaps. Maybe that Jesus is trying to frustrate us. But that doesn't seem to be par for the course for God. Maybe, what is he trying to do? Maybe he's trying to teach us something. We wait. And maybe he's trying to teach us something. But what? What could he be trying to teach us in the waiting? What could he be trying to teach us in the waiting? One of the things about waiting is typically it seems like you wait for something beyond your control. It didn't matter how bad I wanted to get home that night. It didn't make a bit of difference. That traffic wasn't moving, and I was stuck there. It doesn't matter how bad I want that cup of coffee. That red light's not changing. It doesn't matter how many things you got on your calendar. That doctor is going to his schedule, not yours. One of the challenges of waiting, it seems, is that like, is it shows us how little things in life we have control over. But if we pay attention to life, I think we find that out as well, how little control we have. When you have little ones, you realize they cry on their schedule and they eat on their schedule. 
And there's not much you can do about it. You have no control over it. Then you see those little ones get older. They start driving. And you realize how little control you have over that. Then you send them to college or to the workforce. You realize how little control you have over their choices and over their lives. But then, then, then the worm kind of turns a little bit. Then those of us who raised our children then have to do something even harder than raising our children. We have to raise our parents. As parents get older, and I found out that raising teenagers is easier than raising parents, because at least the teenagers respect me. <laughs> You've heard the old Dave Ramsey line, it's called the powdered butt syndrome. When somebody's powdered your butt, they don't want to hear your opinion. But we realized that we, as we, so we saw how little control we had over our children as they grew. And as we get older and our parents get older, we see little how, control, how little control we have over their health. <laughs> in fact, we see it in ourselves, don't we? How, little, how many of us look at our lives and our health and realize how little control we have over that? It was funny, this past week we were looking at our scheduling for Christmas. And we talk about birthday gift for Christ. I'm like, we didn't do it that way. They said, we did this last year. I'm like, no, we didn't. That's not how we did it. I'm like, that's not what I remember. I don't remember us doing it that way last year. They said, Andy, you were getting a kidney taken out and had cancer last year. I'm like, oh, yeah. So I don't remember that. I didn't plan on that one, did I? We see how little in life we have control over, don't we? So maybe the waiting teaches us how little in life we have control over. And when we realize how little in life we have control over, it then teaches us something else. Trust. When we realize how little in life we have control over, it teaches us trust. That we have no option but to trust. We have no option but to trust in God. Or maybe to use the language of faith of, of the Bible, it teaches us to have faith. To have faith. Because see, one of my favorite chapters, we're gonna, we're gonna go here next week. We're gonna look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is a great chapter in the Bible. It's one of those great chapters in the Bible that everyone should study. Because here's what's interesting in Hebrews 11. 11. We see all these Old Testament saints. We see all their lives. We see Moses and Noah and Abraham and all these Old Testament saints. But every one of them, the Bible says this, they longed for something that they did not see in this life. They longed for a home, for a country, for something that they did not receive or gain in this life. So what we see with all of these Old Testament saints, with all of these individuals, is we see that they had to hold to faith because they couldn't control it, because they could not gain it, and because they could not do it. And y'all, I don't like that. I don't like holding to faith. And I don't like having to trust. I want to fix it. I want to do something about it. I want to make it work. My daddy taught me, hard work covers a multitude of sins. I, I was raised by my mentors in ministry. Work harder and love your people more. And it'll all be okay. That's what I want to do. I want to fix it. I want to make it right. I want to solve it. I want to put my nose to the grindstone and get it taken care of. That's what I want to do. But so often in life, we find that doesn't work, does it? We find we are up against something that we can't fix. We find we're dealing with something that forces us to wait, to pause, to give up control. 
And that cuts against us sometimes. We don't like it. It's so hard. One of my favorite things in the Bible is I love in the book of Acts. How often in the book of Acts, Paul will give his testimony. Paul gives his testimony many times in Acts to different people in different places, usually to Roman leaders, but he's always giving his testimony. And, and, and usually every time he gives it, we see a little bit different spin or a little bit different take on it. There's one time in particular when Paul is giving his testimony, when he quotes Jesus, where Jesus appears to him and says, Saul, Saul, why do you kick against the goads? I love, that's one of my favorite phrases in the Bible. I don't know, there's something about that phrase, kicking against the goads, that I've always liked. I, it's just an evocative phrase. Just, I've always enjoyed it. I don't know why. So I've always been curious about goads. So I did some research on what goads were. And we actually have the, the great, great grandchildren of goads in our life today. You know, Rome. Rome built roads everywhere. The, the phrase, all roads lead to Rome, that's true. Rome built roads all over Europe, all over the Holy Land. In fact, if you ever go to the Holy Land or Europe and see some of these Roman roads that were built 2,000 years ago, they're in better shape than some of our Jackson roads. I'm like, these roads are in great shape 2,000 years later. But what they would do is these roads would lead you to Rome eventually, and these roads were used by walkers, but were also used by horses and donkeys and things like that to haul stuff. And they had on the side of these roads these things called goads. Goads were little balls with little prickly things shooting off of them. And the purpose of the goad was if a horse or a donkey were to step off the road, they would step onto a goad. And that goad, would, they would go, ow! I don't know if they'd say ow or not, maybe. But if it was Balaam's donkey, he'd say ow. The rest of them maybe just make a noise. They'd get back on the road. The goad was there to keep them on the road. Our modern example is you're driving the interstate, and you run off the interstate, and the asphalt's broken up, and your car shakes to get you back on the road. That's a modern-day version of a goad. It was something that was there to keep the donkeys and the carts in the road, just like those, that broken asphalt is for us today. So Jesus tells Paul, when he saw, he says, Saul, why do you kick against the goads? I love that example. I love that imagery. There's Paul, just wearing out his foot, kicking that goad. Kicking that goad. Barely got a nub of a foot left. He's been wearing it out so hard. Because he wants to do something about it. He wants to fix it. He wants to get that goat out of the way. He wants to solve it. And God's telling him, the answer is not to kick against the goad. The answer is to realize you have no control over the goad. The answer is to release it. To trust in God. To have faith. To wait. Right now in your life, there's some goad you're just wearing out. You're kicking that thing with every ounce of energy in your life. You're wearing that goad out. But you look and see the goad's not moved an inch. But your foot sure is hurting. You've been kicking and kicking and kicking and kicking. Maybe it's a work thing. Maybe it's a health thing. Maybe it's a church thing. Maybe it's a family thing. I don't know. 
there's something right now in your life that you are just wearing out by kicking. And all your kicking and all your control and all of that it's not making it any better. And you're sitting there, five o'clock traffic outside of York, Alabama, just wanting to go home. And you're not moving an inch. Maybe he's teaching us to let go. Maybe he's teaching us to have faith. Maybe he's teaching us to trust, to relinquish control and trust. Maybe that's what we learn in the waiting. Maybe we learn to turn over control and to trust. Because here's the thing, y'all. Today's first Sunday Advent, Sunday of hope. And what we find out is counterintuitive that when we let go, when we relinquish control, when we give up our myth of being the master of our domain and the myth of being in control of all things and the myth of having it all figured out and just let go of it and give control of it to God we find then the hope that we never find of our own strength and of our own accord and of our own work it seems as though so often the life of the Christian is found up in the waiting Advent is a season of waiting. In these coming weeks, we're going to talk about waiting. But we do not wait in vain. We wait, and as we wait, our God has much to teach us. May we listen. May we understand what we have control of. And may we learn to trust God through faith in all things. Let's pray.